The following is a presentation of the Redskins Broadcast Network. Welcome to Redskins Chronicles. I'm Larry Michael at Redskins Park. Each week here on Redskins Chronicles, we take an in-depth look at a piece of this team's storied legacy. And as we wrap up the season today, a sit-down with one of the 80 greatest Redskins, the great Brig Owens. The Redskins wrap up the season on Sunday in New York. And to say this season has been a disappointment would be an understatement. The Skins stand at 3-12 and with just one game to go. Last week, falling in heartbreaking fashion of the Dallas Cowboys. It was an intense game for the fans of the Burgundy and Gold. And again, it did not end well. Here's the highlights brought to you by Ameritel. Spurlock fields it. Great no. tackle to the 50, 45 to the 40, up the right sideline, 30. Spurlock up the sideline, and he's going to get knocked out of bounds inside the five-yard line. Straight give up the middle. Breaks a tackle to the goal line, and he's in. Touchdown, Dallas. Fields it at his own 44. Heads out to the right to the 50. Inside the 40-yard line of the Cowboy 37. That's a nice, nice. return. From 36 yards out on the left hash, the kick is on the way, and it is good. They bring the house. Romo set. He's sacked by Brandon Merriweather. Looking to cut the lead to one. The kick is up, and it's good. Here comes Pickers on the blitz. He avoids him. Romo has time. Going back to the end zone for Des Bryant. Catch is made. Romo back to pass. Heat up the middle. Dumps it off. Cluts the catch. And he fumbled, fumbled it. Fumbled. He fumbled it, it's loose, and the Redskins have it. Cowboys offsides. Free play for Cousins. Slant the Garcon into the end zone. Touchdown, Redskins. Garcon gets it in. Back to pass, Romo. Steps up, fires left, and it's intercepted. Intercepted by the playmaker, D'Angelo Hall gets the pick. He's got time, goes over the middle, and is caught by Garcon at the 30. He is now the Redskins' all-time single-season receiving leader. So hand off to Morris again. Into the end zone, touchdown! Touchdown off for Morris, and the Redskins take the lead. They bring five. Romo under heat over the middle. Wide open, Cole Beasley at the 25-yard line. Bailey set, the kick is up, and the chip shot is good. First and 10 at the Redskins, 21. Quick pass to Des Bryant at the 20. Breaks the tackle at the 10. Inside the seven, down to the five. Again, a handoff to Murray. No Running way. out to the outside. He's caught by Hall, giving chase. And Murray loses eight yards all the way back to the 12-yard line. This is it from the 10-yard line. Romo back to pass. Still looking. Runs up. Looks to the corner. It is caught. Caught by DeMarco Murray. And it's a Cowboy touchdown. Final score tonight at FedEx Field. Redskins fall to the Cowboys, 24-23. Each week here on Redskins Chronicles, we take a close-up look at a piece of this team's history through the eyes of the men that played the game. And today, Amanda Mitchell and Redskins historian Mike Richmond sit down with the great Brig Owens. That's coming up. And a reminder from Diageo, to all Redskins fans, responsibility is a team sport. Please drink responsibly. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by AAA. Welcome back to Redskins Chronicles. I'm Amanda Mitchell, joined by the one and only Redskins historian, Thank Mike you. Richmond, and Brig Owens, defensive back, Washington Redskins. Brig, thank you so much for joining us hey, today. It's a pleasure being here. Now, Brig, you had quite an interesting upbringing from what I understand. Let's talk about your early years and how you got into the game of football. I would look back how I got in, into the game of organized sports. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, one of 13 kids. I'm the middle child, the one who was being pulled in different directions and a little rough around the edges. <laughs> and I, I, was, uh, I was caught stealing bikes at the boys and club in, in California. And I got caught by the athletic director, a fellow by the name of Pete Lapis. He caught me and took me home and told my mom either I had to join the boys club or he's gonna take me to the juvenile hall. And naturally, I ended up joining the boys' club. I think Pete paid for my membership. Went to the uh, boys' club, and that was my first exposure. I think I was 11. Uh, my first exposure to organized sports. And uh, I learned about uh, 
uh, consistency, teamwork, respect your opponent, and uh, it was the first time that I'd ever had a chance to travel outside uh, my neighborhood or, or the, the city. And so it was quite the experience. And uh, Pete uh, was one of these guys that he made you always clean up after yourself, uh, after practice, you had to clean up, your, and clean up the gym, clean up the locker room. Even after we won games, he'd make us clean up. And say, when you, things are neat around you, you know, you're gonna feel better about yourself and you're gonna play better. That put me in the right direction. Also, he would check your grades uh, all the way to, uh, into uh, high school. And if your grades weren't right, you couldn't play. He'd make you come and you sit down and watch practice, and then you had to watch the game if your grades weren't right. But I, was, I always made sure my grades were right. And you went to college, <clears throat> and you ultimately chose football. How did you make that decision? And was it because of some of these stories you're telling us now? No, I, I, in high school I played football, baseball, um, basketball, and ran track. And uh, I loved baseball, but I didn't like practicing baseball. And so football uh, was the, uh, uh, the game that I really enjoyed. I was a, a quarterback uh, in high school. I had a very good coach, uh, uh, Coach Gil Tucker, who was, uh, again, uh, taught me the fundamentals of, of the game of, of football, also knowing your opponent better than they know themselves. And so when I went to college, uh, uh, making the adjustment was very easy. I remember when I was a rookie in Dallas, you know, they give you an exam once a week and you had to score 90 or better, and I'd always scored 100. And uh, I would drop everyone's assignment, and Coach Landry came up to me one time and said, uh, Brig, you don't have to drop everyone's assignment, just yours. You know, I said, I, I wasn't trained that way. Mm -hmm. And so those kinds of fundamentals, I think, helped me through my early years of, of sport, but also helped me through my professional a career as a professional football player. But what a lot of people don't know is that you were a quarterback at Cincinnati. And then when you came to the NFL, things changed. Talk to me about when you were drafted <laughs> and when you realized you were no longer a quarterback. <laughs> Got drafted by the uh, Cowboys and after a pretty good scrimmage and uh, Coach Landry said, uh, we're going to try you out at uh, defensive back uh, tomorrow. And I said, I'd never tackled anyone before never played defense before. And he said, you're, you're a great athlete, we have to find a place for you, and, uh, but you'll be all right. So anyway, uh, that next practice, uh, we had a nutcracker drill, and where you had the one-on-one -on -one, uh, in between the two bags. And uh, <clears throat> my person I had to tackle was a guy by the name of Amos Marsh, and he was a big fullback. His thighs were big as my body. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get this guy down? And I, then I went back to fundamentals of how do you tackle? I said, I've got to hit him on the numbers, get his butt, and take his power away from him, get his feet out of the ground, take his power, and, and keep driving. And so when uh, the coach blew the whistle, Dick Nolan was the coach then. Um, coach Nolan blew the whistle. I hit Amos and took him down, and all I heard was, great tackle, Brig, great tackle, oh my God. And when I got up, what I thought was sweat was blood. And that's how I ended up with these 11 stitches. So that was, so that was my quite very first an initiation tackle. into your but, new position. <laughs> well, I went back, uh, I went back to the, uh, my room, and Bob Hayes, who's the Olympic world's fastest human, Bob Hayes and I were, were uh, roommates, and Jerry Rome, who was a at Tulsa was, was also right next to us. And I'm packing my bag, I'm going home. And we trained in Thousand Oaks, California. And uh, I grew up in Fullerton, California, so I'm just bus ride from home. <laughs> I'm packing my bag, I'm going home and gonna get me a job. And, and Bob comes in and he says, Ruma, where are you going? I said, I'm not gonna stay here, they're gonna use me for fight. I'm not gonna make the ball club. And he said, no, you're one of our leaders here. You, got, you, you can't go home. And Jay Rome said, yeah, brother, you can't go home. You, you're, you're one of our leaders. I said, I'm going to go home to get me a job. I got my college degree. I'm okay. I'm going to. And he said, they said, well, tell you what, stay for, until after the afternoon practice, and we'll take you to the, uh, to the bus station. Well, Brig, it's a good thing you didn't go so, home, which we want to hear more about. 
<laughs> when we return, Redskins Chronicles will be right back. Welcome back to Redskins Chronicles. We're joined here by Brig Owens, and Brig was just telling us about how he was about to quit the NFL. Brig, what kept you coming back? Well, uh, like I said, Bob Hayes and Jerry Rome talked me into staying in the afternoon practice, and I spent the afternoon practice trying to give someone else a black eye before I left. And Coach Landry mistaked that for being physical, and so I made the ball club. And then the uh, the following season, I was traded here to Washington D.C., which was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So it's you know it's a great trade for me, you know. So it's, uh, Washington's a great city. The fans are unbelievable here. When you got here, it was much different uh, than in, in in Dallas. You know, back in, in '65 and '66, there were still a lot of racial issues going on. And, in Dallas, there was a place that we couldn't, couldn't live, a place we couldn't eat, and those kinds of things. But coming here, Washington was just going through the integra integration as well. But the fans here love their Washington Redskins players. And they just sort of welcome everybody. And so it was a much different environment. Uh, I remember going on an autograph tour uh, in, in uh, Tidewater, uh, uh, North Fork, Richmond. Tennessee, North South Carolina, and Atlanta, and never really running into some any of the racial issues that I'd heard about. And I think it was because uh, the people saw us as their Redskin players. Now, speaking of uh, coming here to Washington, <coughs> uh, you were a rookie, or actually, you spent uh, the year with the Cowboys on the taxi right, squad. Right. Then you were a rookie here in, right. in D.C. in 1966. Right. And uh, we have the Giants this weekend. You had one hell of a game against the Giants that season, 72-41. to 41. Redskins, uh, you returned a fumble and an interception for touchdowns. Tell us about that game. Yeah, I think it was three interceptions and a fumble uh, for a touchdown. And it was, like, it was one of those games that kept going on forever. And I remember Sam Huff, he hated the Giants because the Giants had traded him here. So he was still mad at the Giants. And he wanted to kick the extra points. He wanted to kick field goals. You know, Brig, you got you to pick off another pass. Let's run the score up. And I said, you yeah. know, Sam, the game's going to be over pretty soon. He said, we're going to get another touchdown. But it was a, a fun game. I didn't like the fact that we let them score so many points. And I, you know, I'm a poor loser. And uh, if I can beat a team by 50 points or one point, so long as we win, that's the most important thing. So did Sam Huff really call that timeout? Oh, yeah. Sam, Sam he, he wanted to find a way to score some more points. So, Brig, tell us about your favorite year as a Redskin. Every year has been a great year. Redskins. I've enjoyed every every moment of it. I had some pleasure having some great coaches. At uh, Coach Vince Lombardi, uh, who scared the devil out of me, called me uh, over and said, uh, "I want you to catch some punts after practice, and you better not drop one." And uh, after that, he asked me right into into the, uh, the stadium with him on his golf cart, and. First thing he asked me, he says, you know, he says, uh, are you married? I said, yes, sir. He says, it's a great game. We had the privilege of playing here, and you should never take the game for granted. And that's all he said. So I got to uh, into the locker room, and the guy said, where you, did you get traded? Where are you going? I said, I don't know. So I got home that night, and about 11.30 that night, I get a call from Coach, coach uh, Lombardi's secretary. and said, the coach wants to see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock and uh, bring your playbook, and that's always the key. Knowing Lombardi, his time is always 15 minutes ahead of time. So instead of 8 o'clock, I got there at 7.15, thinking that, uh, you know, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And so he was there, and he walked by the hallway, and he took a double take, and so he called me into the room and said, uh, I understand you have one of our projectors. I said, yes, sir. Do you have some of our film? I said, yes, sir. He said, are you using it? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you and Chris Hamburger my defensive captains. And Chris is going to be coming here a little later. And I have another projector that's more up to date than what you have. So you can keep that projector. I still have that projector. And that's how I ended up becoming one of the uh, defensive captains for the Redskins. So how did playing quarterback and help you quarterback? The well, side playing the uh, quarterback in, in college and high school uh, helps you uh, anticipate what the offense is going to do. You know, you get into that 
quarterback's head, but you get into the coach's head, and you also study the tendencies of what that team's going to do, whether they're on the right hash mark, left hash mark, uh, what offensive set they're in, uh, down in distance, uh, time on the clock. You anticipate those kinds of things, plays that they like to run. And those are all done with regards to how you study your, your players, I mean, your, your opponents. So going back to the question before, we talked about the Lombardi years. Would you say that those were your favorite years as a Redskin? No, I think, uh, like I said, every year was, 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 was been a great year. I enjoyed it. And then we had Coach George Allen come. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he took it a whole another level. You know, you had both coaches that were uh, great players, coaches. And they had different styles of coaching. Lombardi kept you under a lot of pressure. If you could handle this pressure, the games would be easy. And if you couldn't handle this pressure, he'd get rid of you. It didn't make any difference for your uh, number one draft choice, Heisman Trophy winner, or whatever. If you couldn't handle this pressure, he'd get rid of you. And uh, with George Allen, who was also a great uh, uh, players coach, uh, was more soft-spoken, but didn't tolerate mistakes. Since we have the Giants this week, let's take a look back to 1966 and that game where you were the one-man gang. It was fun for everyone but the New York Giants on a day the sky rained footballs. The scoreboard flashed and changed like a pinball machine gone crazy. Number 25, A.D. Whitfield, scored three of the first four Washington touchdowns. The defense scored two. The Redskins scored on control drives. Or on one swift blow. Jurgensen threw, and Taylor caught. It wasn't even safe to punt. Throughout the barrage, the Giants were scoring too. Greg Owens tallied his second touchdown on a fine piece of running and excellent blocking. It was a team effort with fine individual performances. When it was all over, the Redskins and Giants had shattered the record book on a day the sky rained football. What a game, Brig. How does it feel to look back at that one? I enjoyed it. Great game. I, again, I said being here in Washington, D.C. For, for, the, for, the, for the fans here, it's a great experience. I had a great 12 years. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll take a look at what the Redskins have going on this week when Redskins Chronicles returns. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by Diageo. It reminds all Redskins fans, responsibility is the team sport. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by AAA. Welcome back to Redskins Chronicles. I'm Larry Michael at Redskins Park. Coming up Sunday at 1 o'clock, the Redskins wrap up the season, taking on the New York Giants at the Meadowlands. The Giants, after starting by losing their first six games this year, have righted their ship 
They've won six of their last nine. They're six and nine on the season and coming off a win over the Detroit Lions in overtime. Eli Manning was solid while not spectacular. He's had a rough year in terms of throwing interceptions. He's thrown a career high 26 picks this year. Last week though, he engineered his 25th career winning drive. Giants defense made the big plays against the Lions. Will Hill had nine tackles, but most importantly, his pick six of Matthew Stafford tied the game in Detroit. Dias Kiwanuka had two sacks. Justin Tuck had an interception. The game winning field goal by Josh Brown in overtime gave the Giants their sixth win of the year and eliminated the Lions from playoff contention. Giants hosting the Redskins as they wrap up the season 1 o'clock on Sunday. We thank you so much for watching Redskins Chronicles throughout the year. I'm Larry Michael at Redskins Park, and we'll see you right here next season.